Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 382 for Monday, May 1st, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for this episode is capoapp.com from Super Mega Ultra Groovy. And we'll talk about why it is your song learning superpower uh, in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes, Mr. Kent? It goes for sure, man. That's good. It's, uh... Life moves on. We had that good conversation last week about Nam, and had a couple of gigs this weekend. Uh, about to take off on a day job trip that'll take the guitar out of my hands for about eight days, which is feels like a long time to me. I think it'll take the guitar out of your hands and also take the mic out of your mouth uh, or yep. out out of your face. I guess you don't. Actually but you know what? I'll actually out. like. So we're gonna skip. I'm we're very... gonna we're gonna skip next week. Well, that's just, true. Just so I, everybody knows, you know, I am. Um, really committed to vocal warmups. Like even when I travel, I, I do, I do some things in, in a hotel room, I'll go through a warm up thing. And I am really, really committed to doing things to keep my voice rocking. What, you know? what do you, okay. So we're here now. What do you do? Like, what do you, what do you, well, what's, two what's things. So yeah. I'm really into that, that straw training, that stuff that's the, like the negative air pressure against your uh, uh-huh. vocal cords. So that's, that's one thing that I do every day. And then I just have this about this 20, 25 minute warm up thing, which is basically just riffs and scales. Uh, 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 you know, it's, it's, again, 25 minutes, a bunch of different vowels, uh, a bunch of different mouth shapes. And I just do that even when I'm not singing. And I found it makes a huge difference in my life. I, it, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the number of semi-professional singers who don't warm up. I'm also amazed. I, at I'm amazed at the number of singers. professional singers who don't warm up. Like, I, like I, you know, I've I've encountered people in the theater world, m- most of whom do vocal warm ups, but I've encountered a few that are who, who are fantastic singers and find no need for a vocal warm up. I will say that most of them are people who also are like rock singers. There's a whole thing in a theater world world where it's like, Oh, you got to protect your voice and this, that, and the other thing. It's like, you're singing three songs a night, man. Like we're singing three hours a night. Like, like let's have this conversation. (laughs) Well, I I, told you that when we hired, um, cheap trick for a corporate gig, I accidentally stumbled on Robin Zander doing a full on, you know, serious warm up, And he did a warm down. And so this is like one of the great rock singers, right? Yeah. And he was disciplined about, you know, getting his voice ready for the first note and, you know, taking care of it afterwards. I, 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 hate... I don't, I don't want to say that vocal warmups are bad. I, I just was uh, uh, fearful that perhaps what I just said might have communicated that I I'd like th- if they work for you, they're great. I do a vocal warm up in the car on the way to every gig, like w- without too. fail. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I've found one that works for me to share my technique, which I think I've shared on the show, but it's probably been five years. I have, uh, well, I was going to say two songs that I sing, but it's, it, I sing the same song twice. I sing REM's finest work song and, Ooh. uh, it's in my playlist twice. The The second version is the one with the horns, uh, from, uh, from the, uh, the greatest hits record, the one they called eponymous, which I really love that as a name. It's cause that's <laughs> funny. Um, they were clever. They are clever dudes. Uh, but I, I sing the lead, the, the stipe part the the first time through, and that's low in my register and really helps me like open up my chest and, and kind of get the air flowing and get things warmed up without any straining whatsoever, just, yeah. you know, smooth and easy and gets my mouth moving and all that stuff. And then the second time through, uh, I sing the harmonies for it, which are, you know, kind of at the, not the top of my range, but you know, a little bit of a push to my range and it, it works out. It gets me, gets me there. And it also, not only does it warm me up, but it allows me to check in with myself to see where I am for the day. Like, are these notes going to be easy to hit all night or are some of these, do I need to be a little more, 
uh, intentional about how I get there, it, you know, and because right. our bodies are different every day. It's like, that's true. You know, it's just how it. Have be. I ever told you my my analogy of singing and golf? I've never, no, I've never, I've played golf once, but uh, so I don't know if it'll land, but go ahead. So, so my analogy is that, you know, some people can grab a golf club and swing and hit straight down the fairway and no training. They're just natural at it. Okay. Some people can open their mouth and have pitch and breath and, you know, just be singers, right? Yep. Most of us have got to do something to hit the ball down the fairway or keep the, keep the, the note on path. Right. And um, I, I think it's a really apt analogy because, you know, if you're a golfer, it will drive you crazy. People who with no training walking up to a ball and hitting it straight down. It's rare, but there are some people who do it. You don't want to hear about the, the first time, the first and only time I played golf then. So I'll, 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 I'll save that story. Did you hit it right down the Oh, yeah. Down no, the no problem. It was like, it was, well, F you then. It was so. perfect. <laughs> I've never played yeah. since. I was like, I don't know. I was like 14 or something. And I didn't have time to, to get into golf. But uh, my, my so dad funny. actually almost went pro with golf. It was like, do that or have kids. And so perhaps <laughs> there's something there. I don't know. I, like, we've certainly never played golf together. So there you go. But that's, that's singing, too. Some people yeah. just, from whatever it is, they open their mouth and they're singers. And other, others of us who want to sing... I'm certainly in this camp. You have to work at the mechanics that you weren't blessed with. And, you know, I just find that this whole warm up routine has been a game changer for me for putting me in the ballpark to sing effectively, you know, whenever I step up to it. Cause it's, it's not a natural thing for me, but the repetitive warm up exercise and all these types of things make it more natural. I can trust myself yeah. when I open my mouth that I'm going to, that I'm going to be pretty close. Yeah, I it, that that's a lot of what it does for me. I mean, it, it it so it does two it does both things, right? Warming up is good for me on most days. Some days I don't need it, most days it's a good thing. But that check-in to kind of level set and and like you said, get that confidence to trust myself that yeah, what this first if if it's just so happens like the first song of the night is going to be something where I'm like, you know, hitting something super high or something a little trickier for me. It's like, yeah, all right. I, I know where I am. It's not the first time today that I've sang. So, yeah. I, you know, when we played together, you sang, um, no matter what was that song? No matter what, no matter what, yeah, no matter what. And it was a strategy for you. And you, I gave you major respect that I, I've played with a lot of people who like, well, we need a couple songs to warm up. Well, what if your best song, you know, is a push in your range and you want to put it first yep. and you can't do that. And why are you using the first three songs of your show to warm up on your audience? You should be ready to go from note one. And you did that with that song. I remember specifically, we talked about it. I don't remember, I don't remember you warming up before, but you definitely tackled a really challenging song for the first song out of the gate. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I, I remember singing that song. We do it in fling now too, but I'm pretty sure the all-stars was the first place I sang it. Um, and I do, I think we, I, I remember opening the night with it, at least one of our gigs. Um, I had probably I, like the, t I can go a very long period of time between warming up before the gig and then hitting the stage. Like I don't need to warm up 20 minutes before I hit the stage. I, I like to stretch my hands 20 minutes before I hit the stage to get like, you know, the, the sticks flowing the way I want them to flow. But as far as singing, as long as I have sang, you know, that day or that afternoon, um, I'm good that night. Like, you know, driving to the gig is a fine time for me to warm up. So I probably, what I'm saying is I probably did warm up somehow that day, even if it was just at sound check, right. Do doing mm -hmm. something, and, and, you know, again, just checking in with my body and being able to trust it and, and hydrating, like mm -hmm. I can't Huge. stress enough how important it is to hydrate. And if, if you notice you're dehydrated, it's almost too late. I, I mean, I don't mean to say just forget it and like suffer all night, like get, hydrate as soon as you can, but hydrating all day or even starting 24 hours before the gig I mean, it's just good to hydrate in general. So if you get into a good habit with that, then you don't have to worry about any of this, like in terms of timing it, but knowing full well, it's even true of doing the podcast here. If I'm dehydrated coming into the show, I notice like my, you know, my lips smacking and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And I like, I hate that sound. And I know listeners hate that sound. So <laughs> <laughs> like we try to avoid that, you, you know, it's, but it's, it's a thing. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. It's, um, 
It is good. Make sure you tell us about your vocal warmups. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. All right. Now I get to tell you about our sponsor, Capo from Super Mega Ultra Groovy. Capo is my go to app for learning music by ear. And I am hearing from a lot of you that you are finding the same to be true. And this is because. Using music and video players like, you know, YouTube or Spotify or music app or whatever makes it really hard to move around a song to find the right spot that you want to hear again. And when you can change the playback speed, like the ones that let you do that, like YouTube, it sounds awful. I I was literally doing this today and I know better, right? I was sitting at my desk after trying to figure out that triplet drum fill that Steve Smith plays going into the second chorus of Journey Separate Ways, right? And I was actually doing it on YouTube and it sounded awful, by the way, you know, it's like, how do I figure out what, what he's, how's this work? Cause like, I, I got to figure out how to make my hands do the, the right things. And, uh, I know better. So I opened up Capo and I slowed it down and it sounds fantastic. And this is because Capo was built using high end studio quality audio stretching technology. And it, it works. Like I was able to hear like, oh, he's just going snare, high Tom, low Tom kick, Okay. And then, and then of course, you know, came the work of actually sitting down at the drums and teaching my body how to do this and in time and with a good feel and, you know, all of those things. But I, I, the first thing I needed to do was hear it and then play along with it at those speeds. I can do it now. I got to practice a bunch more, but you know, like, like that's the fun part, uh, sort of. Cable does more than that. It'll lift and detect and estimate chords it detects beat locations, so much more. You got to check this out. You've got nothing to lose. Visit capoapp.com or search for Capo in the App Store. It works on Mac, iPhone, iPad. Again, Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy, C A P O A P P.com. And our thanks to Capo for sponsoring this episode. Hey, Paul. Yep. I want more email. I, uh, me? No, well, from, from, uh, the the people that I want more email from, I guess, is really the right thing. I went and saw Amanda Palmer uh, on Saturday night, and uh, she's a fantastic performer, by the way. My friend Billy, uh, my bandmate in Bitter Pill, uh, says we were having some conversation. I forget the context of it, so like, don't take this like all the way to the bank. But um, he he said something. I said, well, at least it's entertaining, you know, about something. I forget. It was like some Facebook like thing or whatever. If you, if you want, you can go find it. I'm sure it's public somewhere. And I said, well, at least it's entertaining. And Billy's response was, music's not meant to entertain. It's meant to make you feel. And Amanda Palmer, we could have a, a long dissection about that. I'm not, I'm not convinced I agree with it fully, but I understand where he's coming from. And, and Amanda Palmer is absolutely one of those artists who makes you feel when you, when you listen to her music. I, I, I don't know that I'm ever really in the mood to like listen to her music at home or in the car, but I I've seen her live. I think four times now, twice were kind of like happy accidents at South by cause of those serendipitous moments. And then I've gone to see her with Lisa uh, two other times, but, uh, but she definitely is able to communicate, you know, feeling very, very well with her music, but she also talks a lot and, and, uh, shares a lot of stories and shares a lot of insights. And she said something at the end of her first set. She said, look, I'm, I'm going to play another song and we'll take a 25 minute break or whatever, but there's a couple of housekeeping things to do. Um, it, one of the housekeeping things was to give a, the microphone to some guy in the crowd who had emailed her and asked uh, her to make a spot in the show for, uh, for him to propose to his now fiance because it went well. So that was nice. But she said, um, look, and and this is the part that I think we all need to pay attention to. She said, look, sign up for my mailing list. She said, I, we don't spam you. We don't send much out, but, and certainly follow me on the socials. She said, which is great. Like I, I would say the same thing about what we do here. I would say the same thing about the bands that I'm in. She said, but all the algorithms that are out there, the Facebook algorithm, the Instagram algorithm, the Twitter algorithm, they're all, doing so many weird things that just because you follow someone doesn't mean you will hear the important to you news about like their next shows or their next albums or what, or their next podcast release. Right. 
subscribe to the mailing list. It is the way that you are certain to be able to hear from these people when they have something to tell you. So uh, we've talked about this before about how Facebook and, and all the social media are not your friend, you know, from the point of but it's not, they're not the friend of the artist or the fan. Like they're nobody's exactly. Friend. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you go to this work to get likes or followers or, you know, whatever it may be. And then they want to charge you to access your own likes and fans and followers. And it, it just makes sense. You don't control your destiny when you're on social. Right. It is a path. And, you know, I, I get so frustrated with that. I would just want to dump it all together, but you know, it, it's a tool that, that will deliver some amount of results, but to put all your chips in on them is, is a fool's errand. I mean, you know, literally the only thing that you really can count is, you know, that one-to-one yes. that email will provide you. Right. But, I, but when, you know, when, and I, it's interesting, you know, these, this thing, these things resonate with us because it, because of, you know, wherever our heads are. And I've been really kind of focused on my email lately in terms of cleaning up the list that I am subscribed to and being very intentional about it because things get to be a mess over time. And she's right. Like I have found things, shows to see things that are interesting to me in my email. Now that I'm paying more attention to like the newsletters that I'm, I'm subscribed to, which I was sort of just punting on for a little while. Um, and when I say a little while, I mean like, you know, five to 10 years, but, uh, the last couple of months, I've really been paying attention to this stuff and, and curating it. And like, there's many things that I would have, that I, that I did miss in the past and that I would have missed in the last couple of months if I wasn't subscribed to the mailing list that I want to be subscribed to. And it, it really makes a difference. So I always used to, anytime I said, oh, hey, you know, sign up for our mailing list for the band. I saw that as a very self-serving thing for me as, you know, the band member, right? The artist saying, sign up so that I can get in touch with you. And, and that element of it absolutely exists. But it also really does serve the person. If you want to hear from us, sign up, subscribe to what we can give you. And I, and the same goes true for the show. Um, sign up for all our socials for sure. You know, the Facebook, we now have a, an Instagram account. So go sign up for that too. Gig Gab podcast and of course, Twitter too. But also sign up, subscribe to the show. And at this moment, I haven't finished, but earlier today, Paul, I started putting together a mailing list for us, which will send out a mailer every time an episode goes live and mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get all the show notes with all the links of all the things that we've discussed right there in your inbox. I don't know why we've never done this before. I guess I just never thought about <laughs> it, but, uh, but I, it, it'll be up within 24 hours of when this episode releases, that will be there. So go to giggabpodcast.com, sign up for that. And, and also subscribe to the show. If you're just playing it, you know, listening when you like see it come across your socials or whatever, don't do that. You'll miss episodes. I guarantee it. You know, please go sign up that way. You'll get all of them. But I, you know, I like what I just did here for the show, we all need to do with, with our bands. And if you don't have a mailing list, go to MailChimp. Uh, they're the, certainly the best place to get started in my opinion, uh, because you can get going for free with it. Uh, well, of course, if, if you're using Banzoogle, then that's even better because you know, you not only are they managing your mailing list for you, but they're also managing your website and all that good stuff. But if you just like, if your website is somehow elsewhere and you haven't yet moved to Banzoogle, then just stick with, uh, you know, go to MailChimp, uh, cause MailChimp can be free to get going. And by the way, as we did with fling, if you wind up migrating your website to Banzoogle, it's super easy to migrate your mailing list from MailChimp to Banzoogle too. So, but whatever it takes, just go do one of those things so that you have a way of telling people, here's how to sign up for the things I want to, to share with you in the future. Yep. Yeah. It, it's super, super important. As I watched her doing it, it was like, Oh my gosh. Like I never thought about it from this angle before that it, it really is the only way for a fan to guarantee that you won't miss out on, on something because otherwise you miss out. So, yeah. Um, I mentioned I was learning that, um, that journey tune, that separate ways tune and especially that fill in it. Cause I effed it up at, at practice yesterday for, at rehearsal. 
I should call this yesterday for Uptown. Um, and we've got we've got a gig coming up in June. My guess is that band probably won't really start to take off. And take off is you know a relative term. It's never played a ton, at least not when I've been in it. But uh, probably you know six or eight months from now, just as as things ramp up, because that's sort of how the schedule for that band works. But I want to ask you a little bit about that band. Can, can we pause for a second here? Yeah. That concept of a, of a very occasional band is a mystery to me, right? You know, I, I stressed for all these years about keeping a band working because that would keep people interested in your project. And how often does that band have something? And, you know, because it's so occasional, is it not the core band that plays? I mean, is it, is it, is it, or, or has, has that band perfectly chose purposely chose people who are like, this is my only project. Yes. I'm a good player. I'm, you know, at this level, but I'm looking for something extremely occasional. This is my project. You won't have any, you won't have any time conflicts with me. You obviously being a different situation. Yeah, no, everybody in the band plays in, in other outfits for sure. So how often is, is it not the core band when a gig does come up? Um, so it, this gig that we're, that we've got coming up in June is the first gig this band has played since before COVID lockdowns. So let's, let's level set there. There was a, 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 ma a massive reset on, on this band. Well, really four years. Cause it would have been 2019. would have been the last yeah. gig. Yeah. So, um, so there was a reset. There, there were some, uh, some of the members remained, some did not. And that's fine. I mean, it, it you know, people, their interests and their, uh, availability changes, but this band that the, the trick with this band is that it is a private event band only. Right. And so those events are booked months out. It It's like, it's never happened with this band that it's been like, Hey, can we play Friday night? It, you know? So we all know well in advance. Now there have been, as as things have gotten sort of as Gary's getting ramped back up to to book things with this band, there have been gigs he's told us about. You know, we shared our calendars with him, of course, you know, like you do, and shared all our avails. And he's like, "Oh yeah," he was saying at, re at rehearsal yesterday. I have, you know, I've I've had to turn down five or six gigs because you know mm. multiple people have been out on that day, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it, like the, the the band wasn't playing for four years, so like this makes sense. I, you know, to book something for October or November right now uh, is a lot more availability. And so like those kinds of things can can work and it generally works to answer your question. When the band was playing regularly, how often did we have a sub occasionally? But it was never a surprise because, again, the gigs on the calendar months in advance, you know, if you can't make it months in advance it's up to Gary whether he wants to take the gig or not knowing that he needs to fill in you know whatever that slot is and so we would occasionally have I remember one gig we had a a different female singer but she was sort of in the band family anyway so it was fine um I'm trying to think if we had any other subs and I don't think so no because I, he just won't book gigs that you know he books very well paying gigs well in advance. And, yeah. And so it, but, but no one is relying on this band to play every weekend. I think it could play every weekend if everybody wanted that, but none of us want that. Right. So we're all on the right. same page with it. And, and it, it actually works out fine. I, I'll, I'll be candid. I, I didn't think this band was going to get back up and running. Uh, like you mentioned that to me. Yeah. There were, there were, I mean, we sort of got rolling, testing the waters in in uh, December. Found we needed a new bass player and keyboard player because our our the guys that were with the band before didn't have time availability. Okay, fine. So Gary found bass player, keyboard player. Bass player came in, great. Keyboard player came in, great. And then the keyboard player scenario like sort of blew up. It, it just was it, it as we rehearsed two or three times, it became clear that this was not the project for him. And so he respectfully sort of bailed out. Great. No problem. Uh, 
And then the original keyboard player that was with the band when I joined, whatever, six or eight years ago, whatever, however long ago that was, he, he had become available since then. Like his winter was busy, but now, you know, he's, he's like, yeah, no, things are fine. So we have him back and that's great. And just at the moment that all that was sort of settling in, our female singer was like, yeah, I don't have time for this. Uh, and nicely. I, I made that sound like she was very dismissive. She was not, she was great, but it was like, okay. And at that point I was like, all right, this thing's dead. Like, there's no way you got to have the right mix between uh, for this band, between the male f- singer and female singer. It's, it's party band, wedding band. Got to have that blend. And uh, it was like, all right, well, you know, we had some fun rehearsals. Everybody gets along. We hang, you know, it's fine. It's like, okay, I, I, I no regrets. We played some fun music together. All good. You know, whatever. We're just having fun. That's the whole point of the band is fun, right? Like that's what we go and deliver is we make people feel happy. So Billy's point. Music makes you feel. Uh, so maybe you're right, Billy. Um, and then Marty brought in this this woman, uh, Steph, to sing that he had sang with in another band. And it's just, it's like been like butter. And where I went to start this conversation, I'm glad we took the detour that we did, was that we got together yesterday. We've got this gig coming up. We have one more rehearsal between now and the gig. And this is, you know, the first gig for Steph and our bass player, whose name is also Dave. So we have a drummer, a bass player, and a sound engineer, all named Dave. Uh, but our it was, you know, first gig with this band, with him and with Steph. So we had to rehearse more than we normally would just to get everything up to speed. But it hasn't been bad. Uh, we've been rehearsing like once every three or four weeks. And what I noticed yesterday, we all noticed it wasn't just me was coming into this yesterday or after rehearsal yesterday, realized, man, everybody showed up knowing everything they needed to know other than me, uh, how to play that Steve Smith drum fill. I thought I had it. And it (laughs) turns out, no, which is why I was working on it today. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew what I was supposed to play. I, I, I mean, it was fine. Like I played a fill and it was like, well, that was pretty terrible, but it remained in time. Like it would have been okay at a gig, but it was like, I'm functional. Yeah, it was functional, but I was like, I want to get this friggin' thing, you know, and uh, because I, Steve Smith, by the way, the the parts that he wrote with Journey, his whole approach to them was to create technically difficult and interesting to him parts that no one in the band or people listening, but mainly no one in the band would yell at him about for creating something too off the charts because they were an arena rock band and they, you know, you need to be like, there's a thing you got a four on the floor. You got to like, it's an arena, man, you know? (laughs) So, uh, he, there's all kinds of things that he has done with these drum parts that you just don't notice until you start to dissect them. It's, it's really very creative. It's great. He's a fantastic player, really like, uh, thoughtful guy and like, Hands like butter, kind of like a Steve Gadd thing, but for arena rock is really kind of how I would go with that. But mainly a prog rock drummer hiding in, uh, in journey Mm -hmm. is really what it is. But, um, but everybody like knew their parts for these tunes, including like, you know, all Steph and I, like if there was a tune that Marty was singing, all Steph and I had to do was, was discuss which one of us was going to sing which part. And we sort of already, like we've played together long enough now that we know, all right, you know, with, if, if the song is in, you know, in this range, I'm going to take the part that's here. Steph's going to take the part above me or vice versa. But we just, we've started to learn that. So we almost don't even need to have that conversation, but like there's zero concern that like, she didn't spend the time to learn the harmonies. Cause she definitely did. There's zero concern in the other direction. I learned the harmony. Like, we come in, we know it, you know, okay, there's no harmony in the first chorus. Okay. Well, you know, how are we going to deal with the second chorus? But there's we like very rare in this band where there needs to be a discussion. And in the, in a cover band, I think that is fantastic. I've been in bands that, that do it other ways. Like when fling was sort of masquerading as a cover band for all those years, we really approach the covers more like originals where we would just sort of feel through them and, and arrange them like we would with an original band, which is very different. Uh, And Fling was also writing originals at that point, which is probably why we adopted that, um, you know, less 
focused on preparation, more focused on sort of the collaborative learning environment um, approach. But with Uptown, it's like, okay, we know what the songs are and there's no surprises here. Like we're, we're playing the songs that make people feel happy. And so it's like, let's just learn them and, and have fun playing them. Like, you know, there's no reason to sit down and wait for the bass player to learn his parts like that. You could do at home. And he did. And there's no reason to wait for the drummer to learn his part. Cause he did that at home other than, you know, that one Phil. Uh, so let me give you a couple of interesting perspectives yeah, on this. Yeah. Yeah. So and it was just nice to have like that, that I, whole conversation nice. we had with, uh, Oh, David, what the heck's his name? I can't think of the name. The, the guy that writes gig performer. I don't know why I can't think of his last name every time it comes up, but he's also the one that plays with like three or four different tribute bands. Right. And he was saying, when he came on, he was like, oh yeah, man, when I started playing with these guys, I learned that you can actually have a band where that happens. And again, in the tribute world, same kind of thing. There's, there's no reason to dissect and discuss, just learn the friggin' song, show up and yeah. then arrange it together, rehearse it together, but you don't have to practice it. So again, very different in an original band. Like it's the whole, like it's a different world, but for yeah. a cover band. Yeah. So the house rockers kind of are becoming that. And, and um, it's funny because our drummer does not like to rehearse, but, okay. he, you know, but he is a incredible preparer. I mm -hmm. like, like, you know, if he wants his time to be respected, he respects everybody else around by, you know, coming absolutely prepared. So, so that has changed over the years. The house rockers were, you could almost tell what parts of a song everybody was going to be, was going to wait and see what happened at rehearsal. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, the, the easy stuff, you know, you'd be prepared for, but you knew, no, 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 he's not going to get this or he's not going to get that. We're going to have to go over to rehearsal anyway. So I'm not going to put my time into it in advance anyway, because we're just going to have to go over to it in rehearsal. Got it. Yeah. So you, you that, come, and that's, that's how fling was and is. And it like, again, it works fine. It, but it's a different approach. Yeah. It is a different approach, but yeah. now the house rockers, cause we're, you know, literally one a month rehearsals and we're trying to turn over quite a bit of the show. It has turned into a pretty, pretty efficient learning machine. And we get together and, you know, the hardest thing in the house rockers is, is vocals. You know, we do three, four part harmonies and that just takes some time. You know, the horns are, are reading and they're great readers and they read their charts down Rarely is there something, and you can kind of tell the stuff where you want to hear the horns play it before you play it out, you know, yes. um, because the horns are that way as well. You know, they, they somewhat rely, I'm a good reader and, you know, I can read, but you can tell that there's certain things you want to hear it, you know, oh, because yeah. You, yeah. So the house records have become similar to what Uptown is. We've become pretty efficient in our, in our preparation. We've gotten through a lot of new stuff. There's a couple things where I thought we had it in rehearsal, went out and played it, and it wasn't quite quite right, and so we had to pull it put it back into the rehearsal, yeah, you know, studio for a while. But in general, we're we're, we're kind of getting there, you know, knowing that we have limited amount of time. But there's still a little bit of you know looking around the room, you know, if you're that guy who isn't prepared, what do you do about that, right? So you hope that the group dynamics weigh in on that. Um, you know, and me as a leader, without shaming a guy too ridiculously, you know, you want to let them know that, hey, I put my time onto this. It's not cool that you didn't put your time into it. And you kind of find the sweet spot. Different people will react to that in different ways. Yeah. And you, you kind of find the sweet spot to coerce people into to good behavior, right? Well, well and it, it, it really does depend on the band, too, because I, I was as we're having this conversation, I'm being reminded of a. Uh, recent bitter pill rehearsal where I knew that we had a bunch of originals, uh, new originals that, uh, you know, various people in the band had written. And so it was going to be like, all right, well, we'll get together and we'll learn those. And a week after that rehearsal, I learned that one of the originals that, uh, we learned that day was actually a cover. And I had no idea because it was a song I'd never <laughs> heard before, but it, you know, it was like, there was certainly no expectation. There easily could have been an expectation that we all would have come in knowing that song. And 
who I, like maybe everybody else in the band did. Maybe I missed a memo. Like, I don't know, but, <laughs> I, but it wasn't like, all right, here's the song. Let's play. Like it's a different vibe. Now bitter pill is primarily an, or, an original band. Like we play covers as part of our set, but like the focus of the set is on originals. And so even with covers, there's no uh, expectation that it must exactly be like the original, right? It's, it's like, here's this song. And just like an original song, here's how this band interprets it. And certainly, you know, if, if I'm playing a part that someone doesn't feel right about, or has an idea about that, like, they will share that with me and I'll test it out and we'll try it out and see what happens. And the same thing goes in all the other directions too, you know, like try singing this differently, try playing that differently. Like, but it was, you know, thinking back on that rehearsal, there was nothing that I perceived to be different about how we approached that song that turns out to have been a cover <laughs> than, uh, than any of the originals. Um, so I, you know, mm. it, it, it can work, right. But the trick is, or the key is that everybody needs to be on the same page. If you've got one guy like like your drummer who doesn't want to wait around for people, like the, the bitter pill approach, the fling approach would probably drive him mad unless he knew that that's what he was getting into, right? I, you know, as much as I liked and appreciated the Uptown Celebration uh, approach of like everybody knows there's stuff coming into the room and there's an expectation of that. Like if... If I showed up not knowing a song, I, th that would be noticed, you know, I mean, if it was just one tune and it happened once, like whatever, like everybody gets one, you know, it's fine. Like there was that a, guy. What, but if you're that guy all the time, uh, you're not going to last in that band I, now. Like, I don't know what it was like before because I'd never really rehearsed with this band before. I'd learned all the tunes. We got together, ran them through once when I joined and then we had like seven gigs. And by the end of those seven, it was like. Anybody need to get together to rehearse? And I was like, hmm, nope, all good. <laughs> Just play the next gig. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, the group I play with down here yeah. is interesting. So it's a four-piece band, keyboards, me on guitar, drums and bass. Yep. Um, very consciously for me, this band has to be low lifting i have to deny stuff down most of my band leader inclinations mm. they're good players they're all very very good players but it's interesting that you know there are some guys who make the same mistakes or you know in, in the same place over and over again and they'll self-admit it oh i gotta fix that but they don't fix it and um again most of those they're definitely not things that the audience hears sure they might not even be things that most musicians will hear. Some might, but in the band you hear it and you, you know, you, you, you can make a middle note, you know, like, Oh, but very, very consciously, I'm not saying, Hey, you know, you're going to smooth that part over. You, you know, I'm just kind of letting it, letting it vote. But it's interesting to me that even with really, really good players, the dynamic of, and the standard of what, must be fixed versus what's good enough is something you hear. So, you know, we talk all the time about what's a professional, what's not a professional. Yeah. And um, that might be one of the lines, you know, the, or, or it just might be the line between ADD and non ADD. I don't know, <laughs> but literally whether you can live with hearing that bad part or live, live with knowing, Oh, it's coming and I still don't have it. And that's because it's on me because I didn't put the time in to, you know, in the smoothest part over uh, is it, just kind of an interesting thing. And again, it doesn't, this band, I have consciously made the choice that I'm not going to be that guy, that leader. Um, but I, you know, I hear it and, you know, mostly in my mind, I reflect that this band is very good for the types of things that it is in. But would I go out and ask $7,500, you know, for this band, mm. you know, given that amount of preparation? I don't think I would. I don't, you know, I wouldn't feel right about presenting something that's not as polished as it should be in in that matter so i i would say the opposite is true as well if everybody in the band was really like no let's come on you know let's make it the best it can be and everybody you know pushes yeah. each other that would be a thrilling thing to you know to try and monetize as much as i can but you can't have it both ways you can't be the musician who good enough is good enough and want top dollar for your services 
Probably not. I don't know about that. Like I, 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 think I can't be that. I can't. I, that I, I get. Right, selling that. Yes, yes. I like. I, but I, I have like when I first joined Uptown, that that band. I remember Lisa. There was one gig that was it was a private gig, but actually had a public component. And Lisa came to see it, and she's like, you know, I expected this band to be better. She's like. Fling's a better band than this. I'm like, oh, well, I know. Like, I'm in both. I understand. <laughs> and she said, but this look like this band literally gets paid ten times as much as Fling does. I'm like, I also know that. I'm in both. I, you know, I see it. And she said, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, no, it's just targeted, marketed differently. Like, it's how it is, and you know, it's just how it be. But I get that there is that impetus to say well i'm not comfortable marketing it that way gary's very comfortable and again the band like uptown was never bad it just you know it hit a minimum bar and that minimum bar wasn't terribly low it was actually fairly high and mm-hmm. you know the band knows how to entertain the band knows how to come in and set up and be professional about how it acts and how we act as we're doing that process the tear down the setup the you know the whole thing we know how to operate in a wedding environment or a, a function environment and all of those things go into it and the performance is part of it. But, you know, by the time people are up to ready to, by the time people are ready for us to play, they're ready to party, man. Like th- th- there's, we would have to go out of our way to make them not happy. Uh, you know, we just go and deliver, uh, you know, the minimum viable product. And it like I, I'm making it sound probably worse than it is, but, but there is that awareness that, you know, we could do twice as much as we are and no one would notice. It wouldn't make a difference for the end That's product. True yeah. You know, and again, like, like what, what I'm seeing out of this band now is absolutely the best this band's ever, ever been. No question about it. Um, it you know, but does it, does it matter? Well, no, other than does it inspire us to want to keep playing together you know, and to enjoy the the time we have together. Sure. Does it potentially inspire Gary to be more focused on booking the band again? Maybe, you, you know, like there's, there's certainly benefits. It's not bad that the band is, is playing well, but it, it's not necessary for this and one. I don't know. Let's be clear. There's a, there's a range of things in yeah. that stuff to polish. Like there's the wrong chord that sounds wrong yes. versus there's a not very thrilling solo you know, there's there's a range of exactly. things. So what is what what really moves the needle in terms of value, right? That's right. And I that's think right. That, yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's right. There's there's the minimum, and you gotta hit that, and then some, right? But but after that, it it's the law of diminishing returns. So I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I yeah but know. some people are gifted, and you know, their their bar for diminishing returns is way higher than other people's. Right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. But as my friend Steve said, you know, we're not doing brain surgery here, right? You know, we're a lot of the stuff is we're taking stuff we hear off the record and putting it into our hands and putting it out there. And, you know, if you do an admirable job of it, it's going to be good enough for 90%, 95%, 98% of the people. Well, and that bar can be set collectively. Uh, Like, again, I'll go back to this, you know, this drum fill that I spent, I don't know, half hour learning today. It's not the first time I've played this song with Uptown, right? I've played this song on stage with the band many times and I just played whatever. And now it was like, oh wait, you know, like I want to put the time in to learn this because A, because I'm like, I like the challenge, but I don't, in like in the past, I didn't even notice that the challenge was there. Mm. It was like, oh yeah, I punched it. T- I know the song. I got it charted out. I know when to stop. I know when to come back in, whatever. Like it's all good. And, and the, the band is, is playing at a higher level now. So it's like, well, wait, 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 I want to, I want to make sure I'm hitting that level. And, and I get to learn this cool Steve Smith drum fill. So like, you know, it's fine. Well, and then there's, there's the concept of the signature parts of a song. Yes. Right. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not hearing in my mind. Is this a signature part of the song? Uh, totally. Yeah. 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 All it's, right. it's, it's a, there's no one else playing. Everybody. If ends you're playing this. air drums. You're playing. This, you're right? correct. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 This would be like in the air tonight. Well, not playing that. I mean, I don't know that there's any fill in rock and roll that 
right. hits that particular standard, but it's approaching in the air tonight. Yeah. For same sure. idea. Y- yeah. Yes. Same yeah. idea. You, yeah. You, even if you're not a drummer, you're air drumming to this. You know this part. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. It's yeah. this triplet thing. Yeah. It's, 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 it's part is like, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. I, I myself am like not in the learned covers to the, to the, nth degree of perfection of what you hear on the record but i am like you know you're missing the point of doing that why did you choose that song if you're not going to bring out the part that if you're not going to nail that thing that people know correct and i think that is a very valuable uh approach to take and, and it is a skill that you can develop in terms of being able to listen to a song and know what the important parts are to nail and then what the, what the parts are that you just need to, to fill space for lack of a better term. Right. But it's like, Oh, there's this signature riff or a signature thing that happens. We need to make sure we communicate that so that when people hear it, it's that thing that's familiar to them. And my friend, Ron Marks, uh, a guy I knew in Austin or a guy I met in Austin, uh, played in a cover band, I think four or five nights a week when I met him. And he was like, oh, yeah, he's like, I've, I've got it down to a science. I can listen to a song once. Uh, I, you know, I hear the chords. This is before you could get all the chords any, you ever wanted on the Internet. Uh, it was starting to get to be that point. But he's like, no, I just play along with it on my guitar. But I hear the parts that I know jump out. And those are the parts I spend the time to really learn and get the tone right on the guitar and this, that and the other thing. And the rest of it, I just, you know, chunk along on the chords because the, the, the singers take, you know, center stage at that point. And it's like, yeah, I get it. Like there's. There's value to that. So I have a friend who has a band in the Bay area and he posted something about being asked a request to play Brown eyed girl. And his answer was, no, we don't play Brown eyed girl. And that our band has a mission statement to kind of do the stuff that nobody will else will do in a way that nobody else will do it. Okay. And you know, we're, we're all, it's a three piece band. We're all quite committed to that. And I was, I had a whole bunch of thoughts about this. I, you know, first of all, I was talking about like, if you're, if you're out there playing, aren't you there to give people what they want? Yeah. But that's me, you know, like, like, I, you know, at first I was reacting to the concept of a mission statement, but, but, you know, nothing wrong with a mission statement. If it's, if it's a unifying thing that keeps all your guys on the same page and gives you, you know, a path to resolving, you know, disputes or, you know, something to hold up that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I was thinking about Brown Eyed Girl and I was thinking like, well, there's punk versions of Brown Eyed Girl. There's reggae versions of Brown Eyed Girl. And I'm trying to think about those in my mind as we're having this conversation about like, Brown Eyed Girl is such a good song that you can do those multiple things to it. And it is a very different feel to it. And as long as you get to the sing-along part in some, some, some way, shape, or form of Brown Eyed Girl, you it'll go over. I mean, yeah. it'll, it'll it'll be that song. Everclear's got a killer version of Brown Eyed Girl. See? Yep. I but it, you know I say that with the full awareness that I'm not sure how I would feel about it if it was the first version of Brown Eyed Girl I'd heard. Right. I think mm-hmm. a lot of these these great very interesting and and captivating covers of songs that we know so well only exist because we know the original so well right That's like so true and and there's nothing wrong with that but you know you hear some but it sometimes been that song if you started from the reggae version if you, if you right yeah exactly hard rock version yeah, maybe yeah. it would have like i'm not saying but it but there's there's a good chance that the only reason or the primary reason we like the you know, off the beaten path cover is because we know it's the ironic. original so well. Yes. There's a, 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 yeah. An amount of irony in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have a, um, I have a, a little bit of a gear gab, Paul. I got to check out this new thing from Sennheiser. It's called the profile. It is a USB C microphone. And, Anybody that's heard me talk about microphones, especially microphones like this one that are built for like your streaming setup, a podcaster, YouTuber, you know, whatever you're doing in terms of streaming. I am very hesitant to embrace the concept of a condenser mic in those scenarios. Uh, 
most USB microphones are condenser mics. However, most condenser mics are not great for what I'll call broadcast work. Uh, condenser mics, and again, this is this is a general rule that is absolutely able to be proven false. But most of the time, with a condenser mic, you it winds up picking up you know a lot of room noise. They're just built most of them in a way that's just not for broadcast work. However, if you build a condenser mic for broadcast work and you control the gain on it properly, uh, they can be fantastic. And the uh, Sennheiser profile falls into that realm. It's 199 bucks. And that that's the, what they call their streaming set. So not only do you get a microphone with that, you get a, a very capable desk clamp. This isn't one of these, you know, $14, find it from the Chinese store on Amazon, like boom arms. This is a really decent quality boom arm. It clamps onto your desk. It holds the microphone up. And the thing that I like about this, um, this profile and probably why it works so well, it has three, three controls on the front. Well, four, if you count the mute button, which I suppose we should, um, it has a gain which makes a huge difference, as I said, in terms of being able to really dial it in so you can get a nice close sound if you want without picking up all the bounce off your walls if you have bouncy walls, which most of us do in our offices and stuff. Uh, it has a uh, headphone jack on it because as a USB mic, it is able to be both a microphone and like a sound input device as well as a sound output device. And so it's got a headphone jack and you've got a volume knob for the headphone jack. And then, and this is the part that most USB mics, even if they have a gain knob, don't have. It has a mix knob where you get to mix how much of the sound of the microphone goes to the headphones versus how much of the sound from the computer goes to the headphones. So for example, if you were using this mic, Paul, while we were doing the show, uh, you could control how much of yourself you hear versus how much of me you hear mm. by controlling the blend knob. And then, uh, you know, once you set the blend, then you can set the the relative level of it. So you can make it so that you're hearing plenty of yourself and you're hearing if you wind up, you know, smacking the mic and all of those things. Like it's a really well put together thing and it just sounds fantastic. I, I'm, I, I, I let it kind of sit. Uh, uh, you know, in my, my pile of review things, cause I was like, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like a USB condenser mic. I, they, they, that, that family of things does not have a good track record with me because I'm right. really particular about this stuff. But, uh, this one, absolutely, man, it's, it, it blew me away. So 199 bucks and that's with the thing. You can get it even less expensive if you just, uh, with the, I say with the thing, with the, the, Cl desk clamp boom arm and you can get it even less expensive if you uh if you go that so route. i have a gear gap question for you yeah man so i am fascinated by the concept of a high-end microphone manufacturer who makes a stage microphone at a reasonable price so like neumann makes a you know stage microphone which is really expensive right okay and um so mojave which makes great studio microphones they came out with a stage microphone, a cardioid microphone called the MAD, $159. They recently lowered the price. And again, they typically sell fairly expensive microphones. So I'm somewhat fascinated. I've got, you know, some some fun bucks at Guitar Center, but I'm, you know, just it doesn't grok to me why this high-end kind of expensive studio manufacturer, studio gear manufacturer, has this really kind of low price point you know, model, right? So are they trying to compete directly with Sure, which was not what their brand is. So it, it's sure. just not, it's no just not lining intended. up to me why they're playing. <laughs> no pun intended. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just not lining up to me why they're playing at this price point. And they actually just lower the, you know, the list price of this thing. So if anybody out there has given this Mojave Audio MAD cardioid microphone a try, let me know, please, how it works if it sounds as good as they say it sounds. Huh. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just fascinated by it. So I'm, I'm going to reach out to him and see if, it. see if we can get one here in the, uh, in the gig gab, uh, labs and, and check it out because yeah, yeah lab. Look, well, I, you know, it's downstairs in my office with the bouncy walls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, for 159 bucks on Sweetwater. Uh, you know, I'm looking at this, it's a dynamic mic. 
And yeah, it's it like all the sort of, I've never heard of this before. You're, this is the first time I'm hearing of it, but they're saying that, you know, it's for all the things that you would expect a handheld dynamic mic to be good for. So, you know, live sound in general, but also broadcast work because it's got, like you said, a decent uh, cardioid pattern. It's not a hypercardioid pattern pattern. So you don't need to worry about if you're using stage monitors, you know, if you use that, that direct off axis, a hypercardioid often has a pickup, uh, part of the pickup pattern right opposite the uh, element to the mic. So if you've, if you're using a hypercardioid, put your stage wedge off to the left or to the right, not right underneath it. Cause it'll, it'll squeal at you if you, if you, uh, if you do that. So yeah, this is, um, this is interesting. Um, I'm curious about this. So I found out Mojave. I did, I recorded a four song EP yeah. years ago in the studio. I did it um, in, used Mojave mics both on my guitar and on um, for vocals. And they sounded great. I mean, really warm, you know, super. And so the brand Mojave, I, I associate with really high end. So again, this, that's why this is throwing me for a loop is that why wouldn't they compete with Neumann for the, you know, for the handheld. It's got market, a, um, right? it, I'm looking at the frequency, frequency response graph. And like most handheld mics, it's got like a little bit of a boost heading up toward 10 K and then it falls off faster. You know, it falls off down to 15 K pretty quickly. I'm looking like compared to the Heil PR 35 that falls off. They, I mean, they both fall off, but it falls off less. Um, the, the, the PR 35 has got like a peak at like 5 K and then comes down a little bit and plateaus and then starts falling off maybe at the 15 K mark. Whereas the, um, the Mojave is peaks at 10 K and then, and then falls pretty quickly. So like maybe there's something in there that it's got, like that's how they're getting some sparkle out of it. And then, and then having it fall. I don't know. I'm curious to check this out. Yeah. Now, especially now that you've, you've, you've wet my whistle. So to speak. So right. we'll, we'll reach Mr. out to Mojave. Me. If you're out there. Yeah. Yeah. Let us try. Let us check one out. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? Cool. Well, I love gear gab. So uh, <laughs> I know lots of you do too. I know you say it's an expensive segment of the show. We understand. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't like gear. So we're going to keep doing it. You know, Hey, here's the thing. Less gear this week than last week. So, you know, this, this show, this, episode is less expensive than the last one you're welcome you're welcome <laughs> we got anything else man i'm good bro all right folks as we said we are off next week we'll be back on uh the 15th ish have fun out there keep playing work on those parts what's the other thing paul always be performing always be performing that's it thanks folks see you next time <laughs>